Let me introduce you to a couple of computer science characters that you might recognize. First, there's crunch time Charlie. Charlie goes in for quick and dirty code whenever that's good enough to do the task at hand. But sometimes it isn't, and then Charlie has to pull an all-nighter to do the work, as you can see from the cans of energy drinks in the pizza box. Charlie is really an adrenaline junkie. But the problem is, all-nighters are no good for long-term retention, and so Charlie ends up not achieving all that much. Next, there's fastidious Francis. Francis is one of those people who goes in for desk tidying stationary organizers and has an Instagram ready array of succulents and all their pens are nicely lined up. Francis spends so much time making things tidy that there's not enough time to get deep into work. And so they end up not achieving all that much. Lastly, timely Terry, the overachiever. Terry makes everything look effortless and the way they manage this is by not sweating the small stuff and they plan ahead for what they'll need in a week or a term or a year from now. You've probably figured out by now that I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about the algorithm design strategies that we've been looking at in the last few videos. Crunch Time Charlie is the design strategy that performs operations as fast as possible, for example, the very lazy push that we saw in the linked list priority queue, and the price we pay is that mess builds up and later operations can be very slow. Fastidious Francis is the design strategy that gave us the binary heap. This is a pristine data structure, every little bit of it satisfying the heap property. It means that pop in is as fast as it can possibly be, but the price is that push is much slower than it needs to be because of all that fastidious tidying along the way. And Timely Terry is the amortized design strategy behind the Fibonacci heap. This is lazy where it can be, so push is fast, but where there's more work that's needed, like in Popmin, then it's done in such a way that we can benefit from this work in future operations. In this video, we're going to look at a completely different data structure called disjoint set. And the, the challenge will be to see if we can carry over these design strategies to a completely new problem. To introduce the disjoint set data structure, let me start off with an algorithm that uses it, Kruskal's algorithm for finding a minimum spanning tree. If you remember Kruskal's algorithm from an earlier video, good. If you don't, then don't worry. The only thing we need in this video to know about it is how it uses its data structure, and that's fairly simple. Kruskal's algorithm starts with an undirected graph. And the first thing it does is create a disjoint set data structure, which it then populates with all the vertices of the graph by calling the add singleton method. Think of each vertex as belonging to a set, and at the beginning, there's one set per vertex. Next, it iterates through all the edges of the graph in order of edge weight, lowest weight first. The first edge is between vertices E and F, and Kruskal's algorithm calls get set width on both vertices to find which sets these two vertices belong to, and then it merges these two sets. So now we have five sets in total, one of them a set of size two. The next smallest edge is A to B, so we merge the A set and the B set. Next edge, C to E, so again we merge the two sets. The next smallest edge is C to F, but C and F belong to the same set already, so the test on line 11 fails and we skip over this edge. And so on, until we've worked through all the edges in the graph and we've produced a single set, assuming that is that the graph was connected in the first place. The purpose of Kruskal's algorithm is to pick out the edges that we've highlighted on the left-hand side. But for this video, what we're going to study is the data structure behind it, the disjoint set, and how to implement these three operations, add singleton, get set width, and merge. We ought to write out a proper abstract data type for this data structure, press pause, have a read, then think how you would implement it, and then press play when you're ready. Here's the crudest implementation possible, the engineer's implementation. We'll just use a dictionary, 
let the keys be the items we want to store, and let the values be some arbitrary set identifiers. Here I've made them strings with the slightly silly prefix h for handle. This really is crude, and crude is good if it lets you ship your product faster. But this is an algorithms course, so let's try to be more refined. There's an obvious simplification here. There's no need to bother with inventing these silly strings to refer to the sets when we have some perfectly good handles already, namely the items themselves. Let's say that we'll pick some arbitrary representative for each set, and we'll make all the other items in the set point to it. This is just for tidiness. It doesn't change the operations in any meaningful way. It's pretty obvious with this how we implement get set with and add singleton, of course, and the only operation worth mentioning at all is merge. If we want to merge two sets, x and y, and remember, we're referring to sets by the representative items, then all we need to do is trawl through the entire collection and replace any y values by x. Which is a bit daft. <laughs> Why on earth should we have to trawl through the entire collection? Can't we find a way to just work through the elements that have to be updated? Well, yes, we can, if we keep enough pointers around. Here's a more explicit picture. Each item in the data structure has two pointers, one pointing to the set's representative, the other pointing to the next item in a linked list that traverses the set. And so it's pretty easy to see how merge works. Given two sets, i.e. two representative items, call them x and y, we'll just iterate through set y, and for each element, we'll update its parent pointer. The amount of work we have to do is big O of the number of items in set y, and set y could potentially be of size n minus 1, where n is the number of items, so the worst case cost of this operation is big O of n. On the other hand, get set width is totally trivial. It's just looking up a parent pointer, so it's big O of 1. Um, I'm going to simplify my diagrams from now on, and I'm just going to draw this sort of simple, simplified sketch with only the parent pointers, because for what's coming next, I want to emphasize the tree structure. What we're storing here is a forest, and so we could call this implementation a flat forest, because all the trees in it have depth 0 or 1. But the linked list pointers are still there. The implementation definitely needs them. If you don't keep all the details in mind, it's easy to get tricked into using a big O of n squared algorithm when you thought you were using a big O of n algorithm, and then you ship your product because you only tested it on small n, and then the customer complaints start rolling in. Anyway, we're computer scientists, and we're studying algorithmic complexity, and in this video, we're going to go all out for speed. So let's just note an obvious speed up here. Let's say that we'll store the size of each set and when we do a merge, we'll pick the smaller of the two sets to update its pointers. The worst case is still big O of n for a single operation, but when you do aggregate analysis, which we'll talk about later in this video, this turns out to be a significant improvement. And this optimization, by the way, is called the weighted union heuristic. Okay, that's our first serious implementation. Can we do better? Let's go back to our three computer scientists. I'd describe this data structure very much something that fastidious Francis would come up with. The data structure is immaculate. Every item points directly to its sets representative, and this makes get set with as fast as it possibly can be. But the cost is always having to update all those parent pointers. So what will Crunch Time Charlie do? What's the quick and dirty implementation, the one that could make merge be O of 1? Pause the video, see if you can come up with the answer, and then when you're ready, press play. Here's something we could do. We could store the sets as trees, and let the root of each tree be the representative for the set. Then, merging is totally easy. We just pick one of the sets and make its root into a child of the other set's root. There's just a single pointer to change for this, so this is O of 1. We might call this the deep forest implementation because we end up with a forest and because some of the trees in it might be pretty deep. That's the downside, of course. Because the trees get deep, get set with can be slow. 
If we have an item at the bottom of the tree and we want to get the set's representative, we have to walk all the way up to the root, and this is O of n in the worst case. Once again, though, there is an obvious speed up here. Why not pause the video, see if you can come up with it. This is the obvious speed up. For each tree, we'll also store its height, also known as rank. And then, when we merge two trees, we'll just pick the lower rank tree to be a child of the larger rank. Let's say here, the blue tree has rank 2, the yellow tree has rank 1. So when we make a yellow tree a child of the blue tree, the resulting rank hasn't changed, it's still 2. Ranks only increase when we join two trees of the same rank. So this strategy should keep ranks low in the data structure as a whole, and this should speed up the get set with operation. And this, by the way, is called the union by rank heuristic. OK, back to our friends. We've just seen what crunch time Charlie would do. And we've already seen fastidious Francis' approach. But what about timely Terry? How can we get the best of both worlds? How can we make merge be big of one, fast and lazy like crunch time Charlie does it, but not pay the price with a slow get set with operation? We have to somehow learn the lesson of the Fibonacci heap. We have to make it so that whenever we call a potentially slow operation, in this case get set with, and we do the work that we have to do to get the answer, we have to leave enough of our working behind in the data structure, you could say manifest it in the data structure, so that later operations can reap the benefit. This is a good point to pause the video. See if you can figure out the strategy. Press play when you're ready. Here's something we can do. We'll start off just like the deep forest with its big O of 1 mergers, and we'll keep track of ranks like we did before. And the only difference is in get set with. It starts out like it does in deep forest walking up the tree until we get to the root. But then we'll walk up the tree a second time and we'll update all of the pointers so that they point directly to the root. We're trying to make the tree flatter so that later calls to get set with should be faster. And this nifty little trick is called the path compression heuristic. Just one small note here about ranks. When we apply this path compression, the tree might end up becoming lower height. But we won't bother updating the rank because that would take lots of extra bookkeeping work to figure out whether or not a given path compression actually did change the height. There's no point having a speed up if the paperwork you have to fill in takes more time than you save from the speed up itself. So we'll simply treat rank as an arbitrary value which we set and update using the formulae given here. OK, so these are our three strategies. Flat forest, which keeps all trees height 0 or 1. Deep forest, which is lazy and can end up with very tall trees. And the third implementation, we might call it lazy forest, which, when it has the opportunity, do some work to flatten the trees. So how fast are they? I'm just going to state the results here. The first result for the flat forest implementation, that's left as an exercise on the example sheet. The next two calculations are rather interesting, and you can find the calculations in the recommended textbook for this course. These results are really lovely. The algorithms that we came up with, I would say they're pretty straightforward and common sense, but the analysis takes an awful lot of clever thinking. I love maths results like this, where it's simple to state the problem, but fiendishly tricky to answer it, like Fermat's last theorem. Anyway, this last result for the lazy forest. There's a function in here, the alpha function, that comes from deep in the bowels of discrete maths. Here's roughly what it looks like. Alpha is 0 for very small n. It's equal to 1 for n equals 3. It's equal for 2 for n equals 4 up to 7. It's equal to 3 for n up to 2047. And it's equal to 4 for n up to 10 to the power of 80, which is more than there are atoms in the universe. To all intents and purposes, we can say alpha of n is constant. So the aggregate cost of m operations is big O of m, 
So the amortized cost of a single operation is big O of 1. As I said, I think this is all really beautiful discrete maths. Practical algorithmics, on the other hand, is a very different matter. Let me finish with a race to see how these three implementations actually fare against each other on a real data set. I started with this picture of a handsome stoat. I created a mesh grid on top of it, one vertex at every point on a hexagonal grid, and I put in edges between adjacent grid points. And then I assigned edge weights. For each edge, I took a color patch from the pixels at the two vertices, and I measured the difference between colors, and I gave an edge a high weight if the colors are very different. So, this gives me a nice graph on which I can run Kruskal's algorithm, just like we saw at the beginning of the video. I'm showing all the singleton sets as small gray points, and whenever I join vertices, I color all the vertices in the set the same color. At the end, of course, we'll have joined absolutely all of the vertices into a single set, and so the whole image will be a single color, but along the way we get to see clusters. You could use this, for example, for image segmentation. But the point of this, of course, is to have a look at running time. Here, I'm running all three of our implementations, the flat forest, the deep forest, and the lazy forest. And underneath, I'm plotting the forests that we're creating. I'm running all the algorithms at exactly the same speed. I coded this to keep an exact count of how many pointer operations each algorithm is performing. Well, it wasn't the lazy forest that won. The moral of this story is, take big O complexity results with a pinch of salt. Big O hides constants, and just maybe, if your data set is smaller than the number of atoms in the universe, these constants might matter.